Oh. All right, hello. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, like I said, I'm Kate Heil, the Full, full Circle Health Addiction Medicine Fellow. Um, I did my residency over with um, Full Circle Health or FMRI through NAMPA, um, and now I'm here. Um, I will start us off with the talk about benzodiazepine tabers and primary care. All right, so first of all, we are fellows. We have no disclosures. Okay, so our learning objectives for today, um, we wanted to discuss the indications for benzodiazepine usage and kind of what these medications are primarily used for, um, and then discuss the risk, or, or we want to um, have you guys be able to discuss the risks or harms of long-term benzodiazepine usage, and then how to properly identify a patient um, who might benefit from a benzodiazepine taper, and then how to do a benzodiazepine taper and identify and manage any complications that may come up. Okay, um, so one of, oh, so one of the reasons that we wanted to kind of uh, explore this topic or go over this topic is because we know um, that especially in the primary care setting, um, a lot of us may not feel comfortable with prescribing benzodiazepines um, or especially tapering them. We know that there's um, some complications that can happen, and we just want to um, kind of. Um, help ease some worries um, kind of around this topic um, and empower you guys to learn um, about benzodiazepines and salts and then about tapering them. <clears throat> okay, so benzodiazepines first to start off. Um, benzodiazepines, I may say benzos just because benzodiazepines get kind of long. Um, so this class of medications, um, they're technically in the sedative hypnotic um, class um, and they are GABA-A receptor agonists. Um, and what they do um, is they increase of the, the affinity of the GABA receptor to GABA itself. Okay, um, so we do know that there, these are good medications that we can use for a lot of different things, but we do know that there are some kind of harms um, associated with their long-term use. Um, and I'll go over that in, <clears throat> in a minute here, but I wanna start off with saying, you know, what are the actual indications for benzodiazepine medications? Um, with a caveat that this is not like a fully comprehensive list. Um, and for certain conditions, there are gonna be some exceptions that apply. So we have to tailor this to our patients, um, but in general, um, in the outpatient setting, um, benzodiazepines um, have the in, have indications for panic disorder, um, short term use for like social anxiety, short term use for insomnia, aerophobia, um, or like the fear of flying, um, seizure disorders. We also use them kind of <clears throat> in a hospice or palliative care setting towards the end of life. Um, we also use them for muscle spasticity um, as well as ambulatory alcohol withdrawal. Um, and the benzodiazepine. Um, indications or common things that we use them for while in an inpatient or hospital setting um, would be alcohol withdrawal, agitation or anxiety, status epilepticus, and catatonia. So um, both some kind of substance um, or addiction medicine related concerns, uh, behavioral concerns, and then neurologic or psychiatric concerns kind of in the inpatient setting. Now, um, what do we actually see benzos used for? Um, so Andrew and I, some, we, sometimes we see some kind of interesting use of benzodiazepines, um, both in the inpatient and outpatient setting. Um, so we just kind of wanted to name that, um, that we see these medications used for things that may, they may not be like technically approved or indicated for. Um, we do see them used for anxiety in the long term, as well as treatment of insomnia in the long term. Um, sometimes these prescription or these benzodiazepine medications that are prescribed initially for kind of a stress reaction um, or anxiety um, turn into a long-term prescription. We do see them used uh, for muscle spasticity as well. Um, we have seen them used for agitation or kind of like an unpleasant personality um, or as a medication for bipolar disorder or simply because the patient asked for them. <clears throat> And I, I should say, we do also see benzodiazepines used for seizure disorder, which is appropriate. <clears throat> okay, so in general, um, we wanted to kind of name times or certain patients that um, benzodiazepines may not be the best option for. Um, and of course, with everything, there are exceptions, but in general, we try to avoid benzodiazepines in patients with a history of alcohol use disorder, a history of PTSD, and then they are on the beers list for folks um, older than age 65. Um, so going through all of these um, uh, kind of together, and thank you for sending the beers criteria. 
Um, that, Laura, that's awesome. Um, so for history of alcohol use disorder, and we know that benzodiazepines and alcohol kind of play on the same receptor and they're cross-reactive with, with each other. Um, so we find sometimes that um, in folks who use benzo or who have been prescribed or use benzodiazepines, it can actually worsen um, the alcohol use disorder and affect their recovery. Um, so in a person with, so this is not like a, concrete contraindication, but we do uh, in folks with a history of PTSD, like if they're trying to undergo treatment for their PTSD, um, benzodiazepines can um, kind of impede that recovery from that process as well. Um, and then again, they're on the benzodiazepines are on the peers list. So I think twice about prescribing them in folks greater than age 65. Um, and the reason for that is kind of like the risk for over sedation and falls. <clears throat> And then another thing um, to think about um, when prescribing benzodiazepines um, is to think about the respiratory depression risk um, with concurrent use of benzodiazepines and opioids. So that would be another thing um, to perhaps put on this list is something to think about. Okay, so the risks and harms of long-term benzo usage. Um, <clears throat> we do know um, that there are risks of cognitive, cognitive impairment um, and the potential for kind of long-term cognitive impairment with the use of long-term benzodiazepines. We know that there's a higher risk of motor vehicle crashes. And then going back to the beers list, um, there are in increased risk of hip fractures in the elderly, um, such even that if a person over age 65, like the risk is 50, it goes up by 50% if they're using benzodiazepines. Um, another risk would be development of benzodiazepine use disorder um, and a withdrawal syndrome, which we'll go into a bit. Okay, so the benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome, um, these are kind of the most common things that can happen um, when stopping or tapering benzodiazepines. So in, in general, these medications uh, can, um, have people develop, or people, sorry, people can develop a physical dependence and kind of tolerance and withdrawal um, to these medications or this class of medications, which leads to a withdrawal syndrome. Um, so they do need to be tapered um, rather than stop cold turkey. Um, the most dangerous withdrawal symptom of the benzo withdrawal syndrome, of course, would be seizures. Um, so that's the main reason why we taper them rather than stopping them cold turkey. Um, but in general, the benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome is very unpleasant. Um, so folks can develop tremors, anxiety, perceptual disturbances, mood changes like low mood, um, even psychosis. <clears throat> there can also be autonomic instability, so high heart rate, um, high blood pressure and then insomnia. And all of these kind of go, these withdrawal syndromes, or withdrawal symptoms, sorry, kind of go towards, um, you know, what conditions these uh, medications treat. So they are used to treat anxiety and insomnia in some cases. So withdrawing from these medications can have kind of a, um, a negative effect on those. Um, and one thing that's a little bit difficult about benzodiazepine withdrawal um, is some of the medications like specifically um, like Xanax um, have a pretty short half-life. And so people can even go through withdrawal during the day. Um, so what can happen is, you know, let's say someone has developed a tolerance to their current dose of Xanax or Alprazolam, and then they feel rebound anxiety later in the day. And we think, well, is it the medication's just not working? Like, is it not treating their anxiety? Um, or are they actually going through benzodiazepine withdrawal during the day and they're having that rebound anxiety? Um, the withdrawal anxiety from benzodiazepines is very difficult and almost impossible sometimes to tell, like, is it from the underlying anxiety or is it kind of a withdrawal? So it can be very kind of difficult to assess out there. All right. So here's kind of a picture of the benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, some of these symptoms, especially kind of like the abnormal body sensations like bugs on the skin, things like that um, are similar to alcohol withdrawal actually, which makes sense because they're kind of in the, they're in a similar class um, of substances. So how best to identify a patient um, who might benefit from a benzodiazepine taper? So first of all, um, if the patient comes to you and they say something like, oh, these medications, they're not really working for me. I want to get off of them. Or I've realized that my use of these medications has become a problem. I think I'm becoming addicted. Um, or 
I'm going through withdrawal all the time from these medications. It's really distressing that if I don't take my pill right on time, like my life kind of revolves around the clock um, when my pills are due, like they want to get off of them. Um, another thing to think about <clears throat> is if a patient has a benzodiazepine on their list, like, you know, like we have identified these medications can be dangerous for folks. They do come with risks. So especially like in the elderly, like with falls, um, cognitive impairment, things like that, we need to be educating our patients before we start. And then when we're continuing them, like there are risks for these and we need to make sure that we're treating whatever condition that uh, appropriately. Um, and if they don't have a true indication for benzodiazepines, then let's have that conversation about like, what are we, what are we doing with this and how can we, how can we help you better? Um, another thing would be to think about if a patient has an adverse effect. So fall confusion, cognitive impairment, withdrawal syndrome um, from the benzodiazepines, and that would be a consideration for taper. Um, and then if there's a suspicion for a benzodiazepine use disorder. Um, so how to diagnose a benzodiazepine use disorder, that would be using the um, DSM-5 criteria um, for substance use. So taking more than prescribed, eliminate tolerance, um, uh, affecting your life neg in negative ways, withdrawal syndrome, things like that. All right, so in general, we want to talk about how to taper um, these patients. Um, so like with anything, um, so when we start a medication and then we want, when we want to stop it and when we want to taper it, we have to do informed consent. We need to let them know um, what, this, what this is, like why we want to bring this up, why we want to do it, um, and what some of the risks and benefits and alternatives would be. Um, so in general, um, let's say a person is taking kind of a short acting um, benzodiazepine such as Xanax or Alprazolam or Ativan or Lorazepam. Um, we would consider switching from short acting to long acting. So switching from Xanax or Ativan to something like Clonopin, Valium or Librium. Um, and in my experience, Valium or Diazepam is a little bit more common. Um, because it has a long half-life, it's pretty easy to dose. It comes in like fives and in, in, um, in dosages of like fives and tens. So that's a little bit easier to kind of reduce um, number-wise there rather than clonopin comes in like one milligram, two milligram, things like that. And then Librium is in 25 milligrams, uh, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, get those kind of dosages. Um, and then we do kind of like with opioids, make sure that we want to go slow and steady with pauses for plateaus if needed. <clears throat> All right, and I'll kind of take over from here. You're gonna see a theme in our presentations where slow and steady is really kind of the name of the game here. Um, it's best for patients, it helps us uh, better control their withdrawal syndromes and it helps uh, prevent some of those kind of more complex uh, and dangerous withdrawal symptoms like seizure. We really don't want them to have that. All right, so we had talked a little bit on the previous slide about switching from kind of a short-term to a long-term benzodiazepine when we are looking to do a taper. Um, and this can be a little bit on the tricky side just because unlike with opioids, we don't have as robust of a kind of base of literature for kind of what the exact equivalency between these different medications is. Um, but we do have some pretty good approximations here. And this table actually comes from um, a VA guide on how to taper patients uh, from medication. So we see kind of the approximate uh, dosage equivalence. And uh, this is specifically in relation to uh, like diazepam there. So, you know, like one milligram of clonazepam equal to about 10 milligrams of diazepam. Um, and, you know, when you're deciding to maybe switch a patient over to these long acting medications, it is important to uh, kind of keep a close eye on them because it is possible that they could be a little bit underdosed, uh, even if you're using like a kind of conversion table like this. And it's possible they could be a little bit overdosed if you're using a table like this. So, just keep an eye on them during the initial switch and that can kind of give you a, a rough baseline of kind of where they need to be. And then you can start the taper from there. Um, you know, there are different uh, kind of ways of going about the initial taper. I think that 
the VA, at least when they came out with these guidelines, was a little bit aggressive, where they were saying reduce the dose by 50% over the first two to four weeks, and then maintain that dose for a little while, and then start reducing by 25% every two weeks. Um, I think you're going to have a patient who's pretty unhappy with you if you suddenly cut their overall dosage in half, and it will make the process kind of difficult um, over the remaining kind of time period. So maybe going slower than that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then over on the right of the screen here, you just see kind of they came up with just a generic uh, kind of milestone suggestion for how much you should decrease by, you know, if you have a patient taking 40 milligrams of diazepam a day. Uh, perfect. Let's see here. Ah, so there are a couple of different calculators that are available. Um, we left them up here on the screen. Uh, MD Calc, one of my favorites, just because it's available on the smartphone, uh, has one available that uh, I think follows actually that kind of VA rough equivalency table that we saw there. It's also just a few different um, other tables. They're all kind of in line with one another. They do have a little bit of kind of differences depending on what resources they are kind of citing, but uh, I don't think you'd be wrong in with any of them and just kind of monitoring the patient closely. All right, so jumping slightly further ahead than I wanted to, so I'll actually kind of go back to this slide right here and talking about what, uh, you know, an actual taper may look like. And it's also important to remember, you know, and take into account how long a patient has been on benzodiazepines. So say you have a patient who maybe has been on them for a month or two months, that is long enough to develop a dependency on them. Um, and this is a patient who you could actually probably look at a more aggressive taper schedule. Um, you know, you could consider going down by maybe greater than 10% uh, every single week, you know, even maybe kind of like quartering their dosage as they go down, just because the body hasn't had the amount of time as some of our other patients uh, to really kind of make all of those kind of full adaptations. And they will tolerate a quicker taper over a few weeks rather than kind of months to years. Um, and while we're talking about months to years, that's the kind of patient we're looking at who uh, maybe has been taking. Um, you know, higher doses of benzodiazepines for years. Um, so their body is used to having that in place. It is how they function now. Um, and they would not tolerate a really quick uh, taper over the course of like four weeks. Could you potentially pull it off and not give them a seizure? I think you could. Um, but is the patient going to find someone else to go to during this time period because they're feeling terrible the entire time? There's a very high chance of it. So with those kinds of patients, that is, you know, when you're having that conversation about how long this taper process is going to take place, this is the one we're talking about months. It could be over the course of a year or more, depending on how you are kind of tapering them down and, you know, maybe going by that five to 10% a week and taking those pauses for maybe a few weeks at a time if they seem to be struggling. Um, with that next decrease and really just trying your best to kind of keep it patient centered and remember that there is no set schedule that someone has to follow so long as they are progressing towards their goal. That's the important part there. Um, and, you know, with tapers, kind of part of that talking with the patient is managing expectations while they're going through this taper. Um, they are going to probably have a little bit of rebound anxiety. Um, you know, if you are going slow enough, that anxiety should be manageable um, and it shouldn't be kind of debilitating or anything like that. And it's also not unusual to have a little bit of insomnia happen as well, especially if they're used to taking this at night. So the body's used to having that to go to sleep and suddenly it's got a decreased dose um, that can lead to some problems. Um, you know, one way you could potentially get around that is depending on how the patient's feeling about it, you could start reducing doses more in the morning while leaving kind of the evening more intact, which might help alleviate some of that insomnia that might show up. Uh, we talked about kind of the months long process right here, and then we have uh, kind of psychosocial supports. Um, similar to when we were talking about our uh, opioid patients and tapering them, I think it's important to make sure that you are connecting your patients with uh, proper kind of like uh, psychological support to help manage this new anxiety, which is going to start popping up and giving them the kind of tools they need to start managing it on their own rather than with medication. 
Um, CBD can help with that. CBTI, which is specifically for insomnia, can help uh, with some of the insomnia that they will likely experience uh, as just kind of another tool in the toolbox there. All right, similar to last time, what if it all goes terribly, um, which will probably happen every now and then. And with this, it's really, uh, you know, utilizing your resources. So we have these echo office hours, which are pretty awesome. You can come bounce ideas off of uh, some of our attendings and see what their thoughts are on this, get some new thoughts on how to kind of proceed from there. Uh, take a look at the taper schedule. You know, maybe you were going a little bit too fast. Try slowing it down a little bit. And they might tolerate it better. Um, looking at uh, kind of recovery supports, similar to like that, uh, you know, connecting them with mental health support, uh, with counselors, therapists, whatever the case may be, to kind of help them deal with what is going to become kind of a new normal and giving them the, the mental tools to pull this off uh, is very important. And then, um, doesn't happen often, but we have had some patients where we actually have had them hospitalized, um, where you're able to kind of taper them more quickly in a supervised manner um, and kind of monitor for any kind of rapidly increasing signs of withdrawals and take care of that uh, before it becomes a problem. All right, um, then we had just a little list of kind of some interesting uh, supports for patients, kind of further readings. Uh, there are quite a few support groups out there um, online. Uh, benzobuddies.org, benzosupport.org. There are a lot of people who have been on these long-term medications and uh, they are there to help answer questions for patients or provide supports kind of in a more disseminated, almost a kind of help self-help group, which is kind of neat. Um, and could be good resources for kind of your patients. Um, there's podcasts, the Ashton Emanuel is based out of the UK, but has a lot of just kind of reading that uh, it's not too terribly complex, actually. Um, it would be kind of on a patient's level if they had any additional kind of questions and stuff um, that they would like answered. So do not be afraid to refer them to the internet. I know sometimes it's not great for patients kind of start Googling things on their own, but if you guide them, um, that can certainly lead them in the right direction. All right, so getting close to the end here. So key points, uh, basically as we probably all knew, but benzodiazepines, they're not a harmless medication class. Um, you know, they are technically like safer in like the immediate term than like an opioid, where if you overdose on a benzodiazepine, not gonna have a sudden like respiratory arrest or something like that. They're, their uh, kind of harms occur over a longer period of time. Um, so make sure that they're actually being prescribed appropriately. There are a limited number of kind of like true indications for use of these medications. We have a lot better medications for a lot of the things I see these prescribed for. Um, the taper and withdrawal process, it can be prolonged if the patient's been on it a while. You know, come into it expecting that and don't be afraid if this is going to take a you know month to a year or something like that to accomplish. So long as you're steadily moving forward, that's really what matters. And uh, reach out for help if there are any difficulties that pop up. Um, you have resources in the community, which is pretty awesome, and we are here to help. And then just a few different references there on kind of what uh, we used to come up with this talk. And that'll end it. That's it. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions and see what everyone in here is thinking. And maybe we can start it off with our with our panelists. Uh, so if any of our panelists have any questions or thoughts, Todd, you want to go ahead? Um, yeah, I guess I'll just say that. Um... I, yeah, I think Valium is a good choice to switch to, but I, I, I've always used clonazepam. It does come in a 0.5. It might come in a 0.25. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, it's long acting, um, but, I, you know, Valium is a, is, a, is a decent choice too. So, um, but I've, I've, I've used clonazepam in the past when I, you know, when, you, when you're starting your taper and you're switching from one benzo to another. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for giving this talk. Um, I, I could I could speak for the remainder of the 30 minutes that are left all about benzodiazepines. 
Um, and I, I agree, Valium has the long half-life that diazepam does. One thing with Valium that is interesting is that because it's so lipophilic, um, it gets across the blood-brain barrier very quickly. So at higher doses, Valium can, can reinforce the addictive nature of the medication um, because it gets into the brain faster than all of the other drugs. Um, and so I tend to not switch to diazepam until we're really low at really low doses where I can control that a little bit more. Um, or I will use clonazepam or, or um, chlordiazepoxide, um, but they are all good, good choices. The, one, the other thing I would say is that um, the, there aren't very many indications for long-term use of benzodiazepines. And so they're, they are a pretty safe medication overall in combo with opioids, they're not safe. Um, but besides that, um, you know, they're, they're not inherently going to kill people immediately, um, but they are very addictive. They do have an incredible um, potential to develop tolerance um, and withdrawal and, and get people in the habit of absolutely needing them. And anxiety is just so incredibly prevalent um, that benzo use is incredibly prevalent. Um, but re remembering that they are not necessarily indicated for long-term treatment of, of anything really um, means that you know most people in chronic benzos probably warrant a taper. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, um, is that I completely agree on go slow. Don't, don't make them have a seizure. Don't make them be miserable through the process. Um, because it, they are safe drugs for the most part, they aren't going to land in the hospital from taking one benzodiazepine. If they're on it and they aren't having problems, then do the taper really slowly. Now, if they overdose on them or, you know, they're, they're getting, opioids and they go to the ER because they're confused. Those are they're definitely indications for going on a, on a more rapid taper. Uh, and sometimes that does need to do in the be done in the hospital. And the, the biggest caveat there would be if, if they get suicidal when tapering, then that's a, that there's really no safe way to do it without being in the hospital. Um, so that's what I would definitely recommend. You know, one other comment, um, coming off benzos is really kind of a crappy experience. Um, uh, am I still on? Um, huh. Looks like I lost every. You're you're good, Todd. Yeah. We can hear you. Oh, I didn't. I lost everybody else. Um, yeah. I, I heard one. I heard in a lecture a study out of Kaiser in California where uh, patient, patients were on opioids and benzos, and they gave them a choice, one or the other. You got to come off one or the other. And like 90% of them chose to come off the opioids. Like they didn't want to give up their benzos. Um, so benzo withdrawal is um, it's a it's a it's not a fun process. Uh, we, you know, we can't take it lightly. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up. That's why we put the kind of patient resources in there. Um, and there's a book called Blood Orange Night um, by a lady who was prescribed out of for sleep. And she describes kind of her experiences with the taper. Um, the symptoms, like you said, of benzo withdrawal can be pretty unpleasant and they're kind of odd. Um, so it can be really helpful for patients to know that there's other people who have felt this way too. Any other questions or anything? Yeah, any questions from our audience today? So I get some patients that come in and some have been off of medications or on benzos for like three months and they, they say they're addicted and some have been on them for like 30 years. And so I know you kind of touched that briefly, but like, and I've got some who are on it for hypertension um, and so I'm trying to decrease these and I don't know why they were on it for hypertension, but like generally, like how long they have to be on this before they're addicted? Is it even like one or two months or can it like how long do we need to taper them off? Because I have some patients when I tell them how bad these are, they'll just stop them and they never go back, even though I try to taper them. Gotcha. So I think technically you can develop some kind of physiologic dependence, even after only a week. Um, it's pretty quick. But, you know, if they've only been on a week, like that's a super quick taper. You know, that's not taking place over like a month or anything. That's just a few days. You just slime them down, and they're fine. Um, but at three months, you know, if they just kind of come off of them, I don't know how high necessarily the seizure risk is 
at that point, it'll probably also depend on kind of how much they're taking as well. Um, but certainly, you know, I think there is a risk. So it's a good discussion to have and kind of doing a taper. And if they've only stayed been on it like three months, you know, that's that's a taper that can take place over a couple of weeks. It doesn't have to be a kind of long drawn out process or anything like that. <clears throat> I think um, one really important question, I, I'm not sure if you guys address this, but I think it, I think it's really important is, is use of adjunct events, right? You're going through this process. What other meds can you help? You know, get them through this. Um, you know, does hydroxyzine have a role? Does like doxepin at night to help them sleep have a role? Um, does uh, do, you know maybe SSRIs? Um, I think that's a really important topic. Maybe one of you could talk about that for a minute. Uh, yeah. So I mean, certainly, um, adjunctive medications are important, and making sure that we are actually treating kind of the underlying disorder that they might have originally been started on it would also be incredibly important so if it is a problem with anxiety getting started in ssri to get that on board to help treat that underlying disorder would be great um yeah something like doc spend a night to help out with sleep you know in a reasonable amount i think would be perfectly acceptable because if they're sleeping then they're not feeling quite as miserable, which makes this whole process a little bit easier. So that's certainly a good thing. Um, and uh, if they do have kind of, or are more prone to almost kind of like panic attack symptoms, I would think that hydroxyzine would be very appropriate. You know, I wouldn't want them taking it around the clock, which you might have to coach them on it. But uh, certainly I think uh, all of those would be just fine medications. Yeah, I, I, it's, I mean, I've seen people use hydroxyzine around the clock. I've seen people use um, like tricyclics, low dose tricyclics, TID. Uh, may, maybe Dr. Harris can comment on on, on that. Um, I, I don't know if there's actually a lot of data for hydroxyzine for anxiety, but it's used all the time. Um, and then there's gabapentin. People add gabapentin. You know, this kind of this kind this comes up all the time. Um, so I think it's probably worth a couple of minutes to hear from Dr. Harris. See what he has yeah. to say about this. I mean, we. Um, have used more medications for opioid withdrawal that we don't um, typically do uh, are involved with a lot of benzodiazepine withdrawal, but um, gabapentin we have used kind of successfully. <laughs> I'll say kind of because nothing is always successful. Um, <clears throat> and I've definitely seen people who have been working on getting off their benzodiazepines in order to continue opioid medications and people have used hydroxyzine a little bit more successfully than anything else, I think. But uh, again, it, like you said, these, it's using it around the clock and then they have to come off of the hydroxyzine. Um, but I think it's helpful. You know? Yeah. Um, ha, um, what about the other Dr. Harris from a psychiatric standpoint? Um, yeah, the dangers of having too many Dr. Harris's around. Oh yeah, <laughs> I just recognize that. <laughs> um, and we're, we're not even related, but... Um, <laughs> So, you know, the studies, there's not a lot of great studies that show medications for the treatment of, of benzodiazepine withdrawal specifically to replace benzos. And so benzodiazepine withdrawal should be managed with benzos. But there are a lot of studies that, that show that adjunctive medications can help um, in that process. Um, more recent studies have, have been used things like um, pregabalin or um, Lyrica for that. Um, which means that you can kind of extrapolate to gabapentin being used for that as well. Um, they, they won't necessarily prevent withdrawal seizures. Um, hydroxyzine um, can be used as well. Even um, beta blockers like propranolol can be used. Um, but the, the key is that the benzodiazepine still needs to be used as part of the tapering process um, for that to, to really make sure you manage all of the, the symptoms. Now, starting an SSRI solely for the purpose of, of withdrawal wouldn't necessarily work because it takes weeks for, for SSRIs to work. But if they have an anxiety disorder and that's what they're on the benzodiazepine for, it does make really good sense to get them to a stable dose of an SSRI before even starting the taper process. Um, so again, it really does depend on what they're what they're being treated for, what the the um, benzodiazepine is prescribed for. Um, but I wouldn't use the SSRI to target the withdrawal symptoms themselves. Thank you. And I want to bring Go ahead, sorry. other thing up with that. Um, so kind of in the use of beta blockers in folks um, 
as an adjective med for benzodiazepine withdrawal. I think, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's okay, but you have to definitely like be very careful about who you're picking your patient with. Um, with that, so let's say that this person is that you're treating um, meets criteria for a benzodiazepine use disorder and that they're taking more than prescribed and they're taking a lot. Um, what's to stop them from taking a lot of propranolol or a lot of beta blocker, right? And so you have to also be very careful like that they're not going to overtake the beta blocker as well. And additionally, um, monitor kind of their mental health and suicide risk because giving a person a prescription for a beta blocker could be a, a lethal means for that patient. Yeah, that's a great point, Kate. Same reason you would probably want to stay away from tricyclics. Um, quick question for Dr. Jake Harris. Um, uh, Dr. Harris, how long um, how long would you say you'd have to give the SSRIs to, you know, before you'd want to start the taper, you know, to be effective to, to treat the generalized anxiety disorder? And, and how does that compare to um, to treating the depression as far as, you know, number of weeks to, to, to really get a response? Yeah, yeah. You know, some, some studies show that, that you're still getting improved um, treatment up to 12 weeks later, so three months after starting an SSRI without even escalating the dose. Um, that you're still getting improved um, outcomes by being on the medication. So uh, many times you may not want to wait 12 weeks. So I think that it, it, it really is patient dependent. Now the patient who's been on benzos for 40 years and hasn't had an adverse outcome, but is like, yeah, I probably ought to get off of these. I would probably wait 12 weeks, get them on an SSRI, get them up to that dose and then slowly start the taper um, because they've been on it for so long without bad outcomes. The person who accidentally overdosed on their benzo and opioid two weeks ago um, and has had confusion um, multiple times um, as a result of taking this, I would, I would get them started, maybe give them two weeks and then start the taper process. So it really is dependent on a lot of other things, but SSRIs can take months to see the full um, effect from them. Great, thank you.